true murder. It's a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer, The Night Stalker, BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. January 14, 1927. A.J. Mathis, a wealthy elderly chicken rancher, is missing. One of the last of the cowboy sheriffs, Jim McDonald, is convinced A.J. is dead, murdered, and McDonald says he knows who did it and vows to prove it on her. McDonald's leading and only suspect is a former saloon singer and prostitute, Eva Duggan. Short, stocky, and plain, Eva takes off with a younger man in A.J.'s Dodge Coupe. They drive from Arizona to Texas before Eva makes her way to White Plains, New York. While on the run, her young friend Jack vanishes, and A.J. Skelton is discovered buried in a shallow grave. After she's captured, Eva proclaims her innocence, but is convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. Eva says if she was more attractive and a flapper, she would not have been convicted nor sentenced to death by hanging. A movement grows among people opposed to capital punishment to spare Eva's life. They fail, and Eva walks to the gallows proclaiming her innocence. What follows changes how Arizona treats those sentenced to death for capital crimes. Never again will anyone hang for murder in Arizona because of what happened the day Eva Duggan died. Was justice done? You decide. The book that we're featuring this evening is Kill, Bury, Forget, a shocking true crime story with my special guest journalist and author, Rod Cackley. Welcome back to the program, and thank you so much for this interview, Rod Cackley. Hi, Dan. Thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, and welcome back to the program. Yeah. Let's talk about right away about Eva and Jack at Mathis Ranch as you open the book with this. Okay, yeah, this is chapter one. This is time to run. Now, you've got Eva Duggan, as you said, former uh, saloon singer, and when her voice ran out, too much whiskey, too many cigarettes, then she became a prostitute. And this was in the gold rush days up in the Yukon that she was doing this. But now it's January 1927, and she's on the Mathis Ranch with her young friend Jack. Jack is a young, attractive, good-looking guy. At least that's the way she describes him. They've been through a couple of tough days together, and now they're ready to leave the Mathis Ranch. And this is the ranch owned by that wealthy, elderly chicken rancher we talked you were speaking of before. And Eva's been drinking, Jack is wiped out, and they decide it's time to run. Now, they talk about California, and but they talk about also about, Jack asks, how long will these, will people be missing? Or when will they be missing this man? And for how long? Yeah. Tell us about this conversation and what they discuss in terms of the official story of where A.J. Mathis went to. Yeah, see, Eva told everyone in town, in this small town in Arizona, she told them that A.J. had gone to California, that he had given her title to the ranch and permission to sell off the ranch and everything on the ranch. Then she would take the money and go meet him in California where they would be married. That was her story. And that's what she explains to Jack, this young guy, as they're getting ready to leave the ranch. Now, She's cleaned the house. They wiped all the fingerprints off so you can see where this is going. And and they're ready to go. Now, as far as Jack knows, they're going to be driving to California, he and she. Now, you talk about Eva Duggan and how she gets to Arizona in the first place. And you tell at that time she's 47 years old and she had bum rides from truckers all the way from Alaska right. and the Yukon. So, so tell us about yeah. Eva Duggan and her route to Arizona. To begin with, Eva, yes, Dan, to begin with, Eva was born in 1878 in Salisbury, Missouri. She married very young, and then her husband disappeared. Now, even when decided uh, she had two kids, a boy and a girl, she takes the boy and the girl, they're very young, she takes them up to the Yukon, where the gold rush is going on. Now, Klondike, she figures that she can make some money up there 
if not singing, then doing whatever she can to survive. But she figures it has to be better than Missouri, where she was born and raised, and where her husband disappeared. So she goes up there and she does everything she can in the Yukon. She becomes a bit of a celebrity in the Yukon as a saloon singer. But then as she grows older, her looks fade, her voice goes, uh, the whiskey and cigarettes get to her, and she becomes a prostitute. But then she leaves, she gets married a couple of times too, and the husbands, believe it or not, disappear. So she actually was married four times before she wound up in Arizona. The husband disappeared each and every time. So now this is December 11th, 1926, and Eva is flat, busted, broke. She's been, as you said, Dan, hitchhiking with truckers all the way from Alaska down to Arizona, and she's been doing whatever she has to do to pay for the rides, if you understand what I mean, and I'm sure you do. Yes. So she winds up in Arizona, and she really has no place to go. She finds out, though, about this elderly chicken rancher, a guy by the name of A.J. Mathis, who lives alone. They call him Old Man Mathis in 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 the country town. And he's looking for a nurse, a housekeeper, so to speak. And she thinks that, well, she can do that. So she goes knocking on AJ's door, and the two of them strike a a friendship and and a partnership, if you will. Now, back to January 14th, 1927, AJ is gone, seems to be vanished, but his friends and neighbors are concerned. Tell us about this confrontation of sorts with the neighbors and friends and Eva Duggan. Yeah, Eva is... What Eva starts doing is selling off all of AJ's property. She tells the neighbors that he gave her the title to the ranch and permission to sell everything on the ranch, including a cow, where she shows up at a neighbor's home with a cow to sell. Eva also shows up slightly drunk. She'd been drinking, which was not unusual for Eva. Now, you have to remember or realize nobody in this little town trusted Eva. No one liked Eva. They knew what she and AJ were doing. And uh, you'll find out later in the book or in our discussion what they were doing. But uh, nobody liked Eva. Now, all of a sudden, AJ vanishes. And no one really cared for AJ either, to tell you the truth. But the fact is, he's gone. So he becomes, you know, the gossip mill, the rumor mill takes off as to what might have happened to AJ. And like I said, no one believes Eva in her story that he went to California and that she's going to go there after she sells off all the cows and chickens and they'll get married in California. Nobody believes that. Now, these friends and neighbors and fellow ranchers, they go to talk to the newly elected Sheriff Jim McDonald. And he's just been elected to the Pima County uh, just recently. And he's a big guy. And he has this legendary. He's a courageous person by legend. What do the ranchers what do the ranchers discuss with him or what do they tell Sheriff McDonald? Yeah, Sheriff McDonald, as you said, one of the newspapers dubbed him, they they gave him the ne- the, the nickname of the last of the cowboy sheriffs. This guy was a cowboy, he was a miner up north, he was a, a sheriff up north, and his claim to fame as a sheriff was he faced down a man with a gun without firing a shot and got him to surrender. He's a big, tough guy. He's bigger than most of the men in town. Everybody looks up to this guy at least enough to elect him as sheriff. And they go to Jim and they say, look, this is wrong. Eva is lying. We're convinced that A.J. Mathis is dead, and we're convinced that she did it. We need you to prove it on her. And as you said, he just won election. This is the first time he's ever won election to anything. So he knows that not only are these suspicious neighbors, these are suspicious voters, and he's going to need these voters another year. Right. So now he goes over to the Mathis Ranch. What does he find? He goes to the Mathis Ranch, and he finds everything's gone. Everything is gone. And so obviously that raises his suspicions, too. As I said, Eva went to a neighbor and sold a cow. So he knows what's going on here. But yeah, everything is gone. Everything is clean. Everything is much cleaner than you think it might be for an elderly, live-alone chicken rancher. He also notices that, that AJ's Dodge Coop is missing. And so then he goes to speak to Tucson to speak to AJ's banker. What does AJ's banker inform him about. Yeah, you're right. The coop is gone. The Dodge coop is gone. And that's a big thing. But again, Eva said that she had permission to take that. But he goes in to talk to AJ's banker 
it finds out there's been absolutely no activity on AJ's bank account. He hasn't deposited any money. And more importantly, he hasn't withdrawn any money. Now, if he went to California, Jim McDonald figures, how is he going to go to California without any money? Why would he not take money? This is 1927. You don't have credit cards then, okay? So you got to have cash. As Jim says, it's only one place or two places he could think of where you didn't, you could go and you don't have cash. One is jail and the other is the grave. So AJ's friends go to the Arizona Daily Star and speak to one of the paper's best reporters, and that's Jack Weedcock in Tucson. Right. And then they call one of another one of AJ's friends, a uh, Matt Wachter, and he says there's just no way that AJ would have done any of this stuff. Tell us uh, what he says and others say about AJ and the possibility of him going to California. Well, they, first off, they say AJ never would have gone to California because he's just too cheap to go to California. He never would have done that. And his friends say, too, that he never would have given the property to Eva. Uh, he's, they say that AJ did not trust her, did not like her, and actually threw her off the ranch, which you'll find is true later in the story. And so Jim McDonald, there's just one red flag raised after another. And not only was Jim McDonald involved in this, but a new district attorney was also involved in this. Both of these guys are relatively new politicians. So they, excuse me, they know the town wants this mystery to be solved. They want AJ to be found. And if Eva did it, they want her to be convicted. So how do they proceed? Uh, Sheriff McDonald still wants to talk to Eva, Eva, pardon me, and doesn't know where she is. He decides to go back to the ranch again. Tell us about that. Yeah, they went back to the ranch again, looking for more evidence. And what they found, among other things, was an old ear trumpet. Now, this is one of these things you've seen, I don't know, in the old movies, a giant big old ear trumpet that people who are hard of hearing will hold up their ears to hear better. They find it, and they find it in the oven, in the stove, rather, and it's been burned. It was You could see that somebody had tried to destroy this thing, this old ear trumpet, and uh, they find other things. They find blood in the house, and they also, so they come to think, Jim comes to think that the ear trumpet was actually a murder weapon, and A.J., even though they don't have a body, he's convinced that A.J. was beaten to death by the, the man's own ear trumpet. Now, what about the story about this young man named Jack. What did they hear about this young man named Jack, if anything? Yeah, no one's actually seen Jack. Okay, Jack is seems to be, no one has seen him. They don't know much about him, except those who have seen him, though, <laughs> wonder why, how, why a guy like this, a young, attractive, uh, muscular guy like this, would be hanging out with an old woman like Eva. They can't figure that out. But, you know, again, the two of them have been seen together. And one of the times they were seen together is when they were cleaning out the Dodge Coupe. They were washing out the Dodge Coupe. When Jim, the sheriff, finds out about this, that raises his suspicions another notch. Now, in January 17th, 1927, Eva and Jack are, or at least Eva is spotted in Bisbee, Arizona, 100 miles down the road from where they left, and they stay the night. What does Eva, Eva do in Bisbee, Arizona? She goes and sends some telegrams, doesn't she? Oh, right. That's when she sends the telegram. Yeah, she sends a telegram. You know, one of the things that telegrams were very inexpensive to send, so that's how people communicated back in those days. They only cost a few pennies to send. And so she sends a telegram back to uh, one of the neighbors, a woman named Frances Mitchell, the woman that she tried to sell the cow to. And she tells she tells in the telegram, she says, you know, she and uh, A.J. are fine. They're going to get together and everything's good. And she's going to go to California. So that's where she's kind of laying her alibi, if you will, with this telegram. Now, Eva tells Jack that they need to sell the car. And so they they do that. And she also wants him to write a letter and a couple of postcards, and she gives him some reasoning that he does not question whatsoever. And and so that next day, after they stay in this in this town, she buys a one way ticket to Kansas City, Kansas. And as you write, it's time to say goodbye to Jack. Yeah, they're in Amarillo, Texas, and she decides she tells Jack, and he's doing whatever she wants. He's along for the ride. That's all he wants. He's just along for the ride. They're in Amarillo, Texas, and he couldn't believe they were in Texas, to tell you the truth. He thought they were driving to California. Well, no, they wind up in Amarillo, Texas. She has him sell the used car. They get like $600 for that. And then she buys this ticket, as you said, to Kansas City on the, on the, on the train. And that's the last we see of Jack in this story. 
So Sheriff McDonald realizes that the key to finding Eva and this Jack character lie in finding this Dodge Coupe. And despite the not being registered in Arizona, how does Sheriff McDonald proceed with trying to find this vehicle? Well, he remembers that uh, Eva, or I'm sorry, AJ has family in California. So he reaches out to California state officials and finds out, sure enough, that car was registered in California. So after about almost three days, he's able to get the VIN number, the vehicle identification number and the registration number. And now he's got some evidence or some way that he can, uh, he hopes, find this Dodge. And if he finds the Dodge, he figures he'll find Eva. Now, there's a reward. They offer $100 reward at that time. Then it was increased another $250 for the arrest of Eva Duggan. And uh, so they also, Sheriff McDonald, goes to the post office and talks to the postmaster there. What does he find from the postmaster at the post office? He finds that Eva has been mailing postcards. And this is a way that she told Jack. Now, Jack couldn't believe she was doing this, but she was going and and mailing postcards, again, to lay her alibi out, mailing postcards to the people of, of the small town in Arizona where she and AJ had, you know, made a name for themselves, so to speak. And this gives him a clue, uh, gives Jim McDonald a clue of where she might be. And this is how she dis- he discovers that Eva has made her way to White, White Plains, New York, where it turns out her daughter lives. Now, you talk about the arrest, and she is apparently has a job in an, in an insane asylum. Yeah, right. Yeah, isn't that ironic? So Sheriff McDonald has a couple of law enforcement de- or detectives that owe him a favor, and so they go and find Eva. Tell us about this arrest, and as you do, you talk about this interrogation in a dark, cold room with Eva. Yeah, these are New York City cops, okay? And they owe Jim a favor because uh, they had a fugitive they were looking for who wound up in Arizona, and Jim arrested that fugitive for them and held him so they could pick him up. So they figured that, you know, they were going to do him a favor. Well, they go to the insane asylum and arrest Eva and take her back to New York City, and they're whole, they're interrogating her in a cold, dark cell. Now, remember though, Eva went through all kinds of problems when she was up north. I mean, the Yukon. She's a woman who made it on her own in the Yukon and the Klondike. She's not put off by these cops at all. Even though they're tough New York City detectives, they don't crack her. And they do notify Jim that they have her, but they get absolutely nowhere with them, with her. She says things like, you have no body, you got nothing on me, you got no body, you got no murder. So she talks like a very hardened killer in this. Yeah, somebody really needs to do a TV show on this story. I'm telling you what, this Eva is the greatest character in the world. She whispers to these cops. She says, I already told you to where the old man is. Weren't you listening? Or are you people in New York just too goddamn dumb to understand? And then she says, well, the only thing McDonald, Jim, has on me is that I was the last one who saw AJ before the old guy left town. And you know what? Sometime pretty soon, the old man, referring to AJ, will wander back home and make a fool of that cowboy sheriff. He has to take Eva back to Arizona via train. So along the way, he tries to confront her with evidence that he thinks that might get her to loosen her tongue, but it doesn't. Um, And so he resorts to what people in the she refers to as a poker game bluff. What is one of the bluffs that he tries to attempt to loosen her tongue. Well, he tries to tell her that they found AJ's body. And it's a bluff, as you say. It's a total bluff. Now, Jim is in an interesting position. He has to buy what he called a set of city clothes before he goes to New York. I mean, this guy wore, he always had a sombrero on his head. All right, this is a a cowboy sheriff. There's no doubt about it. So he buys the city clothes. He goes into New York. He picks her up. They're going back on the train from New York to Arizona. And he tries to run the game on her that they already have AJ's body. And if she'll confess then it'll go easy on her. Well, what does she do? What What is this bluff? And it gets to the point where she wants to see a body to believe that he has a body. So what does he do? 
Well, yeah, but you know what? She really, she almost buys into this bluff. She almost buys into this bluff because he tells her that they found the old man's car in White Plains, and uh, she's already looking at a charge of grand larceny for stealing AJ's car. Okay, so she's looking at that. So they say, okay, he says, okay, we're going to take you, or she says, take me to where you find the found the body. And that, of course, calls his bluff because he has not found the body. And in and- and what happens is that it's not the skeleton of A.J. Mathis, and she laughs heartily. It's the skeleton of a horse, isn't it? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, they had bones. They found a skeleton. But yeah, it was the skeleton of a horse and not the skeleton of A.J. Mathis. But now they do have her on Grand Theft Auto. So that's where, you know, he knows that if he convicts her on Grand Theft gets her convicted on Grand Theft Auto for the theft of A.J.'s car, at least he'll know where she is and she won't be able to go anywhere. So in the interim, she's at Florence, Arizona, or ends up at Florence, Arizona prison, a prison built by prison inmates, including a death chamber. Now, he knows that if she is found guilty, that he knows where she'll be for the questioning over A.J. Mathis's death. So what happens at this trial for grand larceny, despite the confidence Eva Duggan? Yeah, she's convicted. Now, Jim, too, knows that if she's convicted, that gives him time to find A.J.'s body. And that's what really this whole case depends on, is the discovery of A.J. Mathis, dead or alive. Well, she is convicted. Eva gets convicted on this auto theft charge. So she's going to jail. Uh, She's in the Pima County Jail, and she's going to sit in the Pima County Jail for a while because she's been convicted of this. She's looking at several years in prison. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second to hear from our sponsor, which is Ritual. Gaps in the diet shouldn't be ignored. Over 97% of women aged 19 to 50 are not getting enough vitamin D from their diet, and 95% are not getting their recommended daily intake of key omega-3s. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin was formulated by exhaustive research to help fill nutrient gaps in the diets of women ages 18 plus. It is formulated with nutrients to help support brain health, bone health, blood health, and provide antioxidant support. Ritual invested in a gold standard university-led clinical trial to prove the impact of Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Essential for Women 18 Plus was shown to increase vitamin D levels by 43% and omega-3 DHA levels by 41% in 12 weeks. Ritual has just released Symbiotic Plus, a gut health supplement with clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic all-in-one minty capsule. My wife Lisa and I were initially impressed with Ritual's successful clinical trials and decided to try Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus. And when Ritual for Men 50 Plus became available, I began to take Ritual as well every day. It's been over two years for me and much longer for Lisa, and we both continue to feel a significant difference every day. Right now, we're both taking Symbiotic Plus, as we know gut health is so important. Right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash murder and turn healthy habits into a ritual. That's 10% off at ritual.com slash murder. Now, Rod, we were talking about the sentence that she received. Now, McDonald and the prosecutor Kemp know where she is, and McDonald knows to continue his search for A.J. Mathis. Now, there is an uh, assistant deputy that's assisting Sheriff McDonald, and his name is N.W. Wolf. This is December 11th, 1927, and this involves a machinist from Oklahoma. And N.W. Wolf tells Sheriff McDonald, we have some good news. We have found him. Explain the finding, the discovery of A.J. Mathis by this machinist from Oklahoma. Yeah, N.W. Wolf, by the way, Dan, I think is one of the great characters in the book. I mean, this book is just filled with these cowboys who get into law enforcement. And N.W. Wolf is just like Jim McDonald. He didn't go up to Alaska, but he is one tough character. Now, a machinist from Oklahoma has decided that he's going to move to Arizona and he buys some property right next to the old Mathis chicken ranch. So one day he decides that he he's going to build a house there. He has a couple hundred acres. He's going to build a house there. He has no house now. So what he does is he sets up a tent. And while he's driving a tent stake in, he 
discovers there's soft earth where he is driving this tent stake in. He keeps driving the tent stake in, and guess what he finds? He finds the skeleton of A.J. Mathis, or at least it's a human skeleton, and he uh, rides into town and gets a hold of Deputy Nash and uh, tells him what he's found. Now, they don't know if this is A.J. Mathis for sure, but there's a reporter there that seems to know, and he looks at the skeleton and sees something on the head still remaining, tells him that it's A.J. Mathis. Yeah, the reporter Jack Weedock from the Daily Star, who's another real character in this book, who comes in again and again, he and Jim McDonald are there at the same time, and they're looking at the skeleton, and they both realize that on the skeleton's skull, there is a fringe of red hair, just like the fringe of red hair that A.J. Mathis always had, and A.J.'s dentures are still in his head. So they're pretty sure that this is A.J. Mathis that they have found. December 22nd, 1927, they're awaiting the coroner's decision, and it is that A.J. was murdered and Eva Duggan was instrumental in his death. So that sets up her being charged. She's already in custody and the murder trial. And you describe how big and important this trial was and how interesting it was, fascinating it was for the audience, which was 90% women. Tell us about the murder trial and one of the most fascinating features at this trial. Women and children, Dan, packed the courtroom. This was high entertainment in this little town in Arizona. And you said, you're right, there was standing room only, better than standing room only. People were out in the hallway standing watching. One of the most interesting features of this was A.J. Mathis's skull. They took the skull as part of, it was evidence, obviously, but they just sat it on a table in the courtroom and left it there. And this skull and its empty eye sockets were staring right at Eva Duggan the whole time during this trial. Some of the witnesses that were at this trial included someone that operated a store, and she had spoken to to them about AJ and him leaving to California, but also that she had depicted her Jack, her partner, as her son. And another interaction with someone that was a witness at this trial was the idea that they used aliases when registering in and in rented cabins, again, pointing to their guilt by using aliases at all. Yeah, some of the uh, we had, for instance, a guy by the name of Jacob Bolzer. He uh, ran the El Paso Furniture Company. He said that in January 27, when A.J. disappeared, Eva and a young man named Jack came into his store and asked him for a 50 cent loan. That woman there, Jacob says, told, and pointing at Eva, told me that she needed the 50 cents so that she could get her son a driver's license. She was implying that Jack was, in fact, her son. And uh, so he gave her the 50 cents and they came back and Eva and Jack came back and repaid the 50 cents, put a package on the counter of the guy at the furniture store, and a gun was inside. She had a gun in the package, asked me if I wanted to buy it for $10. I said, $10 is too damn much for that gun, thank you, but no thanks. And that's what I told her. And so, you know, these are the days when everybody had guns anyway, so that wasn't that surprising, but they did have this gun that they wanted to get rid of for $10. Then there was Mrs. George Gaynor, the manager of a tourist camp in Lowell, Arizona, she says on the morning of January 27, on January 17, 1927, Eva signed the name B.B. Jones on the register. Now, why would she sign a fictitious name unless she had something to hide? Again, that's telling the jury that, you know, something's going on here. So that was another sign of Eva and Jack hiding their tracks, if you will. Now, while this is going on, Eva is staring at, and that skull is staring at her. She starts to cough. She begins coughing so hard that it hurts. And with every hacking bark, Eva places her hand on her bosom for relief. She's not doing well. In the beginning of this trial, she was doing all right. She had a lot of confidence going. But now she's not doing well at all, or at least that's the way she wants it to appear. Her attorney is Stanley Samuelson. And so on February 24th, 1928, she makes the decision to take the stand in her own defense. So she starts on indirect examination about how she was a housekeeper and employed as a nurse and starts telling a story about how ill and how sick AJ was. Tell us what she attributed that this illness and the sickness to in the beginning of time. Well, Stanley Samuelson, her attorney, is, you know, everything 
men did to Eva in this story. Stanley is a guy who just stands right beside her no matter what, knowing that she doesn't have a lot of money. He is defending her, though. And again, it makes a name for him in Arizona. But yeah, Eva says that he had, Mathis had an awful lot of medical problems. And one of the big ones was brought on by rotten meat, eating rotten meat. She says, well, she tells it, A.J. killed a rabbit that had boils on it. I showed them to him, but A.J. said the rabbit would be good to eat if I cut the legs off. I told him the rabbit was only good to feed to the chicken, but he made me cook it up anyway. He ate it and he got ill. And then he accused, he was in bed all day and all night. <laughs> they went into town in the hotel and he went to see his doctor, Dr. Charles Peterson, and told the doctor that he was trying or she was trying to poison him. But according to Stanley, the attorney, Mathis had an awful lot of problems, like deafness, eczema, cramps, to name but a few. And Stanley said, my client, Eva, had duties such as giving Mr. Mathis hot mustard baths and foot baths at two o'clock every morning. Mrs. Duggan would also milk the cow, go and get the beast when the animal strayed. She cared for the chickens, fixed the daily meals, and had other general housekeeper duties. But again, the big thing here is that Mathis goes into town to his doctor and accuses Eva of trying to poison him. That's going to be essential in this trial, that accusation. At the same time, Eva spins a tale of prostitution on the ranch and talks about how A.J. was okay with that, except that he he was jealous one time when she stepped out on him without his knowledge. This is shocking for the audience. And then she tells another story about the lies about A.J. going to California. Tell us about this bombshell revelation. Yeah, she says, now, the thing with prostitution, not only did he allow it, he encouraged it, according to Eva, because he knew the prostitution was happening at a hotel in town, and he wanted a piece of that action, according to the way Eva tells the story. But then the bombshell drops. She knows, I mean, tears are rolling down her eye, are rolling down her cheeks, and she admits that the story about Mathis going to California, where he promised to marry her, she admitted that was a lie. The bombshell drops, and Eva admits that she knew, always knew, that A.J. was dead. And not only dead, but she knew that he had been murdered. Of course, she didn't do it. Her friend Jack did it. That's the way that Eva told the story. Well, what he told her, though, didn't include murder. It was sort of sounded like an accident. They were fighting. Yeah, right. They were fighting. Yeah, they were fighting at manslaughter, I guess would be a better term than murder. Right. Right. Well, he had punched him in the solar plexus, he said, and because the man was so old and fragile and feeble, he died. Yeah, they tried right. They tried CPR, but of course it didn't work. They tried to save his life, but of course it didn't work. Right. That's the, that's the way she tells it, yeah. So they ask Eva on the stand, a very important question. They say, why not call Sheriff McDonald? And what's her response? Yeah. Now, the prosecutor wasn't putting up with her story at all. Uh, he did. He said, let me ask you again. She just did not believe that she would be believed. She didn't think that anyone in town would believe her and that she didn't stand a chance if she told the story, if she called the sheriff. So how does this story play out in court? She is cross-examined. Now, this is a direct examination where she gets to trot out this story without any criticism. But now it's the cross-examination. Now it's Kemp and his assistant, Cohen, who attack her on the stand and attack this unrealistic story. Yeah, he uh, Kemp really goes after her again. This is the prosecutor, and he and Jim McDonald want to convict this woman. There's no two ways about that. He wants to convict her, and he goes after her. He just rips her story up. And from day one, the story about prostitution, the story about A.J. encouraged setting up a house of prostitution at the ranch. He attacks everything and goes after her and really goes into her credibility and attacks her credibility. Now, he this case is wrapped up. The prosecution makes its claim to say that there is ample evidence to say that this woman has killed A.J. Mathis, despite much of it being circumstantial. What happens in terms of the verdict? Uh, in the verdict, yeah, he she is found guilty. The jury goes out, came to a decision in anywhere from 90 minutes to two and a half hours, a very quick jury, and they come back and they convict her of murder, and they will recommend the death sentence. What is the response from the audience? What is the response from the newspapers? What is the response from the public after this? Well, as you said in the introduction, Some of the wealthier women in Arizona decide that Eva should not die. And they really 
uh, launch an effort to save Eva from the noose, as I entitled the chapter, February 13th, 1930. A lot of people really don't want to see, uh, Eva, Eva will not be the first woman to be executed by hanging in the West, but she will be one of the first in Arizona. And a lot of people are very uncomfortable with this, a woman sentenced to death by hanging in Arizona. And some people, especially these two wealthier women, or three wealthy people, there's this is Allie Dickerman, among others, the Tucson Postmaster, and two uh, people who are considered to be pioneers in Arizona, John and his wife, Lily Durham. They don't believe the death sentence would have been meted out if Mrs. Duggan had been able to have a better attorney, if she had more money, if she had friends. And they make the point that she was convicted solely on circumstantial evidence. There was no one who saw her commit this murder. It's all circumstantial evidence is the point that they were making. She would be the first woman executed by the state of Arizona, they believe that's wrong. And so they they decide that they will pay all expenses for her appeal. And they are will go to the governor and try to get this overturned. They will try to get a pardon for her. Yes, they, they are adamant in trying to get her a new trial. And they are trying to drum up the idea that there's new evidence. There's something signed by this Jack person. Another thing that maybe A.J. Mathis had written, but... Despite his efforts, uh, the appeal was not successful. Yeah, right. Cards and letters do start appearing, supposedly signed by Jack, who a- admitting to the killing. But even Eva's fate is it's done. You know, they lose all the the attempt to appeal, lose all of those, and she is going to die. There's no two ways about it. Now, there's a bit of a there's a process to this execution as well. And as I mentioned earlier, that. Prison inmates had built this prison itself, but also had built the death chamber. So tell us a little bit about her weight for this and this death chamber. Yeah, the death chamber is a gallows. And they have, uh, and, and ironically, the inmates had built it. They had one prison, an old prison. Then when they built the new prison, they put the death chamber in here, the gallows, and you know, inmates had had built it themselves. Now, part of the process here is a legal process of, to, to get witnesses to the execution. So another of the real ca- interesting characters in here, the warden, uh, Lorenzo Wright, he has to fill out a, a card. He sends out cards and letters, but mainly cards like a wedding invitation printed in a beautiful old English script, black on white, and it said, pursuant to section 1149 of the penal code, we request your presence at the execution of Mrs. Eva Duggan, condemned to die on Friday, February 21, 1930, at the Arizona State Prison at 5 a.m. in Florence, Arizona, signed by Lorenzo Wright, superintendent. So there's a whole legal process that has to go on with this because it was back back in the way old days, back in the 1800s, it wasn't unusual for sheriffs to arrest a suspect and, and hang him up right away, right in, you know, in a tree outside the uh, the jail. Sure. So they, they put a real process into this and they're still hoping at this point that when he's sending these cards out, they're still hoping that maybe they can get her sentence changed to uh, life in a mental hospital, but that fails as well. During this time that she is awaiting her sentence of death by hanging, she meets with the reporter Weedlock, the journalist Weedlock, again, Weedock, and also Sheriff McDonald. Yeah. Are they surprised at her demeanor? What is her demeanor during this, facing this? She she picked up the nickname Cheerful Eva while she was on death row in the state prison in Florence. She is very resigned to the fact that she's going to die. She's been making little uh, knick-knacky kind of things and selling them to her fellow inmates to raise money for her coffin, for her funeral expenses. And she's been knitting, or not knitting, but sewing her uh, burial dress. So she's getting ready. And she becomes quite a celebrity on death row. And she's never afraid once her attorney, Stanley, gives her permission to talk to reporters. She goes off and talks to reporters and she becomes quite the character. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages. Now, in this preparation, you say that there's so many parties that there are people opposed to this death penalty. No woman in Arizona has been sentenced to death or has been executed. So tell us more about this march towards execution and what is done in preparation all around. Yeah, the march to execution, they take her out. They do have a final verdict in late February, and she loses her appeals 
And one of the worries they have, though, when she's back on death row is that she'll kill herself. They do not want, the state of Arizona does not want her to kill herself. They want the execution to be carried out. So the warden, Lorenzo Wright, and the prison's physician, Dr. L.A. Love, they're out with friends at dinner. They get a call and they've found pills and chemicals that Eva could use to kill herself. Evidently, they've been smuggled in by what friends that she has. And so they have that going on. And then Eva sends a telegram. Now, she has a father in California that we find out later in the story. She's a few dollars short of being able to pay for the coffin and the funeral. So she sends a telegram to her father in California, and she writes, have to die, stop. Wire warden, $50, stop. We'll be buried in Florence, stop. Signed, Eva. That's the telegram that she sends to her father. She does not want her father or her son or daughter to be at the execution. She does not want to see any of them before she dies. So she doesn't. February 21, 1930, that's when she makes her final walk, the walk to the gallows. Forty newspaper men are admitted into her death cell. They stand elbow to elbow, scribbling uh, notes, interviewing Eva. She fi They find out that she appealed to the attorney general's office trying to get a pardon. She was turned down. She says, she tells the reporters, I'm going to my maker with a clear conscience. I'm innocent of any murder, and God knows I am. But if the law says I must die, then I must die. She does have one favor to ask of the reporters, though. She asks them for a dollar each, and they open their wallets, and one asks what she needs the money for now, that she's going to die in a couple of hours, and she says she needs the money to finish paying for my coffin. She also wants this mysterious Jack to save her. She wants a letter to Jack. She wants it known that Jack can save her by just sending a letter and admitting Tell us more about this. Yeah, she she really reaches out to Jack and tries to get Jack to tell the story as she told it. You know, she really, to the very end, she maintains that is what happened. That Jack hit A.J. Mathis in the stomach, and that's how he died. And because she believed she would never be treated fairly in the town or by Sheriff McDonald, that's why they buried him. She wants Jack, again, the only witness to this death, to to come forward and and in writing tell what happened. And but it doesn't happen, you know. February fifteenth, nineteen thirty, you write about the American League to abolish capital punishment is still fighting to save Eva from the hangman's noose, and of course they're appealing to Governor John Phillips in a telegram and denouncing Attorney General Barry Peterson, K. Barry Peterson, and they're still calling for the to commute Eva's death sentence. But yet, as you write, invitations are going out in the mail for her hanging. And you had mentioned it before, but it's worth mentioning again. Tell us about these official invitations. Yeah, the official invitations are sent out because they have to get in under, under the new state law. This is a relatively new state law. They have to have certain people in the audience. And they want to make, you know, Arizona's cowboy sheriffs have a history of just hanging people suspects outside the jailhouse. If they find a sturdy tree or even in the courthouse, they would hang people. So they want to set, they make more of a process for the execution in Arizona now. And so they want people like Sheriff McDonald. They want the prosecutors to be there. They want uh, witnesses who will attest to the fact that this person was hung because there were two, there were cases too in Arizona before this of convicted people actually bribing their way out, handing the sheriff some money and then just taking off. Wow. So they want witnesses there to confirm that Eva Duggan did die. Twelve reputable citizens is what the law says. Lorenzo Wright is the superintendent. So what happens on that day of the execution? How is what does Eva do in preparation? What's her demeanor that day? Well, her demeanor that day, she is uh, resigned to the fact that she's going to die. The, the day before, by the way, she asked, you know, the, the, the warden, right, Lorenzo Wright, she referred to him as Daddy Wright. And she asked him what she should wear for her hanging. And the warden said, well, don't wear a fine dress. It will be soiled. Uh, so and then she wanted to make sure that she would receive a Christian burial. All those arrangements had been made. An undertaker in Florence would claim the body and bury her in a cemetery plot that she'd already purchased. Where'd she get the money for this? Sewing and selling beads to her fellow inmates for the past few years. In doing so, she'd raised enough money, except for that $50 that she asked her father for. Uh, she was ready to go. So and then... When they're walking now, is so it's February 21, 1930, Eva's final walk, and they're taking her to the gallows. And she really has a, 
I don't know, a cavalier attitude about this for most of the walk. And she's talking to the guard. She jokes with the guards. She tells one guard not to stare at her so much because they'll think that uh, you like me. Don't hang into my arm that way. She tells another, they'll think I can't walk. Uh, she is she is Eva Duggan till the last dying moment. And she says, we came here to this world naked and fair. Where we go from here, God only knows where. Those are basically her last words. So they set her up. You say that the inmates had had done this. There's the executioner. He estimates the weight of the person that's going to be hanged. There is a trap door. So once that that trap door allows her to hang down, and she should be, by their calculations, be dead very, very quickly. Tell us about the actual execution, the witnesses, what they see, what do they experience at this execution. Tell us the setup first of who is is the spectators at this and what do they witness? Well, as we said, there are 12 reputable citizens in the audience. And in the front row, Sheriff Jim McDonald, County Attorney Lewis Kemp, and one of Eva's favorite reporters and one of the favorite reporters of this story, Jack Weedock. They're all in the front row sitting there watching as they walk Eva up to the trap door that will become her portal to heaven, hell, or somewhere in between for in a mere 60 seconds. At 5.01 a.m., She uh, they put the, uh, the, the noose around her neck. She sways slightly. Lightly, a guard asks, have you anything to say? She shakes her head no, she doesn't say anything. But then she looks down at the witnesses. They are close enough to see her and uh, for her to see them. And she smiles at the witnesses. Now, there are 12 reputable citizens in the front. Behind them are more members of the press. 75 people in all are watching Eva die. She stands on the steel trap door, and and the executioner pulls the handle, and the door falls with a bang and a clang. It's loud enough that the other prisoners back in the prison can hear it. They know that one of their own has died when they hear that bang and clack. Now, as you said, they put the noose around her neck. And this is really a scientific way they they would do this to hang someone. They calculate the weight, the height, and then, and by that, they calculate how they're going to put the noose around the neck. Somebody made a mistake. Eva goes through the door. the, 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 The rope cuts right through her neck and her head snaps off. Her head falls down right in front of the witnesses, bam, and it just rolls with blood spewing from her neck. It rolls in front of right down to the witnesses' feet, and her torso crumples into the pit under the gallows like a sack of wet laundry. You say several men and women fall to the ground, fainting at the sight of Eva's head rolling on the floor with her half-closed eyes looking up at them. Yeah, women are screaming. Many are pushing and shoving their way out of the room, hands over their mouths, choking back vomit. There is another crowd outside the room. I mean, just remember that her trial, how people packed into the trial for entertainment? Right. This is high entertainment, too. So you've got 75 to 100 people in this building. And the 75 in the viewing room are trapped. They can't get out. They're looking at the torso of Eva just spewing blood everywhere. And as you said, the, her, her her head, just the way that AJ's skull was staring at Eva during the trial, that's the way Eva's skull in her head will be staring at these witnesses to her execution. So Lorenzo Wright, the warden, takes control. He just moves in there and basically says, okay, everybody, there's nothing to see here. He gradually moves the crowd out of the viewing room and leaves the prison employees behind to clean everything out, or clean everything up, I should say. Now, as a result of this disastrous execution, especially with so many people wanting her to, her sentence to be commuted to life, what is the reaction of this botched execution? Politicians take over. The politicians in Arizona, I mean, the people are outraged. You know, the idea that a woman was executed like this to begin with, nobody was happy with this, or very few were happy with this, most were opposed. And now you've got her head literally cut off. She was decapitated by the no, by, by the noose, and her head just bounced down the stairs and in front of the witnesses. So movement become begins in the Arizona State Legislature to do away with uh, not capital punishment. They don't want to go that far, but they don't want hanging anymore. So they decide to go to a gas chamber to build a gas chamber. Now, Sheriff McDonald solved this case along with other people. But as we mentioned earlier, there's an election he has to contend with. And that election comes up shortly after this execution, at least in November 5th, 1930. Now, he's running for re-election. What do the voters 
resoundly tell him and why? Oh, they say go away. They do not want him. The Daily Star, the Arizona Daily Star's editorial board writes that never in the history of Pima County have there been more unsolved murder cases than under the present administration of Jim McDonald. The Cowboy Sheriff, the editorial board writes, the Cowboy Sheriff, oh no, one of the, uh, this is from one of the readers of the Arizona Daily Star. He says, the letter writer writes, the Cowboy Sheriff must have worn out his think tank on the difficult Mathis case. People are saying that Jim spent too much time on the Mathis case, and many don't like the fact that Eva was convicted on circumstantial evidence. There are a lot of other cases that I point to in this book, other murders that go unsolved. There's gambling going on in Arizona, in Pima County, that is being ignored, evidently, by Jim McDonald and some of the other county officials. And so there there really is a, a real backlash to this. And uh, there was a woman, for instance, beaten to death with a small hammer. They never found the killers. So a lot of people are just unhappy with Jim McDonald and they vote him out of office. You continue with this story uh, about the warden, December 22nd, 1930, and this incredible misadventure with a trusting warden. Tell us uh, the story and, and why you include it. Yeah, I included this because this is just another, there are so many interesting characters in this book, and I wanted to bring it to a sense of closure, I guess, on on some of the leading characters. And another one is the warden, Lorenzo Wright. Now, this is at the Florence State Penitentiary. This is December 22nd, 1930. Eva's long dead. Right. Now, Raymond Stickler is a trustee. He's also a tailor, and he's been putting in a new lining to Warden Lorenzo Wright's suit coat. He's been doing work for the warden, finishing a suit coat. Stickler says he needs to get some new material from town. He doesn't have it. So he convinces Wright to give him a drive and give him a ride into town. And Wright says, yeah, sure, I'll give you a ride into town. Let me get my son, a little boy, and we'll go into town and we'll get your your material. And then you can fix my suit coat up and that'll be fine. Well, about halfway to Florence, Wright is driving, Stickler is sitting right beside him. This convict pulls out a knife out of his coat and pushes the blade's tip against Wright's rib cage. Now, Lorenzo Wright is a big guy, and this prison convict, the, the trustee of Stickler, is only 5'10 and weighs 140, but that knife, that really equalizes the, you know, the size of the two men. So, and besides, the warden's little boy's in the car, too. So what's he going to do? Raymond Stickler, the convict, grabs the warden's gun out of his holster, so now he's got a knife and a gun, and he's got Warden Wright, right where he wants him. And so he, but anyway, he leaves Wright and the boy alone and takes the car and drives into town where he has his mission now, the stickler, he wants to kill his father. I mean, this is some crazy people in the story. They're just like wild. It's just a wild story. What happens? Continue, please. The stickler goes into a restaurant and she's got a hot car, a gun, a knife, a head start, and $58 in cash he took out of the warden's wallet. But they won't last long, so he decides to rob a coffee shop. What else is he going to do? Get a job, right? There's no time for that. So he goes into the cafe. He's got his gun, his knife, and he goes to, he's got the register open, grabbing cash out. And all of a sudden, wham, one of the cafe workers turns hero and smashes Stickler over the head with a heavy, big coffee urn, boiling hot coffee. Two other cafe workers jump into the fight. They're all fighting. Then the cops show up and they start fighting. Now, they hadn't heard about Warden Wright's kidnapping. They don't know. And they do arrest Stickler. Okay, he's outnumbered. They're putting handcuffs on him. They don't realize, though, the cops do not realize that the guy they're going to have in the back of their car has a gun and a knife. They didn't bother patting the guy down. He's got a knife. That knife that he had that he pulled on the warden, it's in his shoe right now. So he's in the back seat, and this deputy sheriff, Jimmy Davis, is driving the patrol car with Stickler in the back. The second deputy is in Warden Wright's car that Stickler stole, and the con, Stickler, pulls his knife out of his shoe and puts it up against the cop, and they start fighting. The cop starts punching Raymond in the head. You know, they're fighting back and forth. Finally, the car accelerates, swerves into the side of the street, and smashes into a telephone pole so hard the vehicle is demolished. But neither man stops fighting. Stickler and this deputy, Jimmy Davis, are still fighting, you know, tooth and nail. I mean, they're going at it. And probably the second cop, who's in Warden Wright's car, he pulls over, and the two of them together, he and the Deputy Davis, are able to get Stickler under control. You write July 6, 1934, there's a couple men that are going to their death sentence. They're going to be executed. 
But Arizona Governor G.W.P. Hunt, he was originally on their side, was on Eva Duggan's side originally about capital punishment being outlawed. When he didn't win approval for that, he was on board with the idea to switching to lethal injection, to lethal gas as a method of execution. Tell us about that. Yeah, this is a thing where they decided that hanging was not was just too uncivilized and it just was inhumane. So uh, Arizona Governor G.W.P. Hunt and several legislators are able to put and, and the voters of Arizona decide that they're going to build a gas, that they're going to go to gas, a gas chamber. A headline in the Tucson Citizen newspaper promises death by gas will be painless. The person in the death chamber, the paper writes, is not aware of the presence of the gas until overcome. Death is instantaneous. Okay, you know, the, the voters go with that. And now we're going to have the first execution. Brothers, Fred and Manuel Hernandez, they were convicted of killing Charles P. Washburn, a 64-year-old desert prospector living in a shack near Casa Grande, and they are going to be executed today, the first to be sentenced to death by gas in Arizona. They will also be the first to die in a dual execution by lethal gas. And again, I'm putting this chapter in because I want to give this, I mean, this, this is such a big story to wrap your arms around this story. This kind of gives a sense of closure to what happened because Eva Duggan died and the way she died. In closing in this book, what we never find out about is the identity of this Jack. Jack was seen by one of these store owners when he came in and had borrowed 50 cents for a brief period of time and came back in and paid that 50 cents. But you write about at the end that what happened to the mysterious Jack? And we don't know. No one knows. Now, remember, now, see, I have my own theory about this. Now, what I do when I write these books, I read newspapers, the old newspapers from 1927, 1928, 1929. And I really get into these stories. I'm convinced. You remember Jack just disappeared? When she bought the ticket, yes, we never saw Jack again. We did see cards and letters from Jack, supposedly, but we really don't know that Jack wrote those cards and letters. We have no idea what happened to Jack. Just given Eva's history, disappearing husbands, and the death of A.J. Mathis, I don't think myself that Jack survived. And what would have happened to him, you speculate? I think she killed him. I think she killed him in Texas after they sold the car and she didn't need him anymore to drive. Um, again, that was part of the reason she had him. She needed him to drive the car. Cars in those days were not easy things to drive. Like the Dodge Coupe they had, it could never go uphill. It could only go uphill like at 10 or 20 miles an hour. And you always had to have somebody out cranking the front of it to get it going again. Driving was not an easy thing to do. Gas stations were few and far between. She needed Jack to drive. She needed a man to be with her at that point. I'm convinced that she killed Jack. Whether she poisoned him or hit him over the head, I don't know. But that's what I think happened. It, it does have some you lend some credence to your your idea because it seemed that Jack was given only so much information. He certainly wasn't a cohort in this. He wasn't privy to all the information. He wasn't an accomplice per se from all of the evidence you provide in this book. Yeah, right. And that's it. Exactly. I you know to begin with, there's a part of me saying the whole thing was made up. The character of Jack did not exist, but he was seen in that store, a couple of stores. He was seen enough that I do believe Jack existed, and I do believe that she needed someone to be with her, uh, to drive the car, to, you know, to do things that she couldn't do by herself. But I think after she got on that train, when she knew she was going to get on the train to White Plains where her daughter lived, she didn't need Jack anymore. He was just excess baggage. So that's what I think happened. Very interesting idea as well. When you earlier talk about the three or four husbands that she was married to, but they also disappeared. And when you talk about Jack disappearing, if there ever was someone that needed to disappear for Eva's story to not be challenged, it was for Jack to disappear. Oh, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, really. If she did kill AJ, he was the only witness. And if he killed AJ, again, he was the only witness to her complicity in that. Very, very interesting. I want to thank you very much, Rod Cackley, for coming on and talking about your latest Kill, Bury, Forget, a shocking true crime story. For those that might want to check out your other work, you have a website and you do any social media. Tell us about that. I do a little bit of Facebook, but the best way to get me is rodcackley.com. I have a website there. Thank you very much, Rod Cackley. Kill, bury, forget a shocking true crime story. It's been a fascinating interview. Thank you so much, Rod Cackley, and good night.